antibodies, they're a key part of many flow cytometry experiments. In this video, we're going to take a look at how antibodies interact with your cells and also go over some key steps you can follow when selecting your antibodies. Let's take a look. Today, we're going to be all about the antibodies. Probably something you haven't given much thought to since your intro bio classes. Now, if you're looking for a panel design video, that is not what you're getting here. Check out this video instead. First up, we're going to look at the antibody structure. So as you can see in this cartoon antibody I've thrown up here, this is a fairly general shape for an antibody. So they have a Y-shaped structure. All antibodies are composed of two identical light chains and two identical heavy chains. And this structure, the Y structure, is split up into two regions, the FAB region and the FC region. First up, the FAB region. This is where the variable region of the antibody is located. Ideally, this is what you will have bind your target antigen on your cells. The variable region is made up of three complementarity determining regions, or CDRs. This is the part that varies between different antibodies and gives the antibodies their specific specificities. Think of it like a lock and a key. When an antibody binds to its antigen, they fit together perfectly. A different antigen, or a different key, will not fit that same antibody, as a different key would not fit a lock. The second part is the FC region. This is the constant region of the antibody. While it doesn't directly bind antigen, it still plays an important role in the immune response. It is involved in the complement cascade and in activating certain effector cells like macrophages by binding to the FC receptor. We'll have more on this later. Antibodies come in different classes or isotypes, and this is based on the heavy chain. In placental mammals, where the antibodies you'll be purchasing for your experiments will originate, there are five main classes, IgA, IgD, IgE, IgG and IgM. Most of the antibodies you will purchase will be either IgGs or IgMs. There are also two different types of light chains, kappa and lambda. So this kind of brings us back to our previous topic of isotype controls. And knowing now what you know about antibodies, we can now piece together what these isotype controls are and the naming makes a lot of sense. So for example, in your experiment, if you're using an, a CD4 IgG kappa antibody, this means that the variable region of your antibody recognizes CD4, the heavy chain is an IgG, and the light chain is a kappa chain. Then for your isotype control, you would want this, this control to ideally be as identical to your experimental antibody as possible. So have all the same parts, but not bind CD4. So in this case, you would have an IgG heavy chain and a kappa light chain, but the variable region would bind something ideally not found in your cell, making it a control for the binding specificity of your antibody. Now that we've covered the basic structure of antibodies, let's look at how an antibody can interact with your cell. There are three major ways an antibody can bind with your cell. First up, we have the way that we are all looking for. Your antibody binds your antigen with the variable region, and you get that nice interaction between antigen and antibody. This is what we're looking for when we design our flow cytometry experiments, to have our anti-CD4 antibody bind to CD4. The second way an antibody can bind to your cell is through FC receptor binding. As mentioned earlier, some cells contain FC receptors which bind the FC or the constant region of your antibody. Sometimes this is called nonspecific binding. However, this is very much misnamed as this is not a nonspecific interaction. It is in fact a very specific interaction between the FC portion of an antibody and an FC receptor on a cell. It is just largely an undesired interaction. 
the best way to avoid this type of interaction is to pre-block the FC receptor before you stain your cells. Essentially load all the FC receptors so your antibody of interest can't bind there. This can be done using either commercial FC block reagents or by using antibodies found naturally in serum. We have a little portion on this in our previous buffer episode, so if you miss it, there's a link up in the corner, make sure you check it out. Some commercial companies also sell antibodies that are just the FAB portion of the antibody, so it lacks the FC region. And this, if you're having a lot of issues with FC receptor binding, is a great solution because it completely eliminates the problem. No FC receptor or no FC region, no FC receptor binding. And number three, true nonspecific binding. So in actual nonspecific binding, you have antibodies that will randomly interact with the cell anywhere in any orientation. It is completely nonspecific, completely random. Now, it seems like this is something that might occur frequently, but it's actually a very, very rare occurrence when we do flow cytometry staining. And this is largely due to the protein in the buffer. This protein essentially coats the outside and loads all the points where an antibody could stick. So if you are seeing a lot of non-specific binding, go back and look at the protein concentration in your buffers. Looping back again to your isotype controls, this is what they are meant for, testing your protocol. So they will show you if you have things like FC receptor binding or non-specific binding and allow you to then go back and troubleshoot your protocol, troubleshoot your buffers or troubleshoot your reagents so that you can eliminate these interactions. Again, that is what they are used for, not setting gates or anything else, testing your protocol. And here they are a great control for that. All right. Now that we've covered structure and function, let's look at how you might go through picking an antibody. I'm going to show you a quick walkthrough on the computer of my workflow. This is by no means the only way of doing it, just the way I generally go about it. So let's use CD4 from the example I started with and go step by step through my process. Now I like to start with whichever vendor I will be purchasing my antibody from makes the most sense as I need to know which clones they have available. So I know from here I'm going to search for the antibody I want or the antigen specificity I want, the species and the fluorochrome. So I'm looking for CD4 antibodies in a product search. I will be using these on mice and I know that I want a Fitzy label. So let's narrow that down. You can see here, this search then pops up four different clones. Now a different clone is really just a difference in the variable region. And so in a perfect world, if I had endless amount of money, I would test all four in my hands to see which antibody gave me the best results. However, in the real world, this is not practical. And so we want to use the knowledge that is out there to help us pick the best clone for our experiment. So I generally do two things. First off, I look at the staining profile that the company created. So if I go into the product info for the company, you can see that they give you generally a candidate of what this stain should look like, what they produced in their lab. And this looks like a fairly reasonable separation between uh, CD4 positive and CD4 negative on Fitzy. It's usually a little smushed together in that color. Also a good sign that 70 publications noted by the company have used this product. So after that, I mean, I could go through these publications, but I like to use something called BenchSci. So BenchSci helps you select antibodies. They do an AI search of all the papers out there, more extensive and exhaustive than you could do by yourself. So in here, I want to look for CD4 mouse. Now some extra perks of this is I can go through the application and say that I want to look only at flow cytometry papers. And I also know the clone I want to use is this GK 1.5, because that's the one that we originally looked at when we were doing our first antibody search. And then in here, you can start to go through papers and look 
for publications that had staining with that antibody of interest and look to see how the staining looks. Again, you can use whatever sort of benchmarks you like to use, whether it be impact factor of the papers it's used in or how frequently it's used in publications. Really what you can search for in here is endless. I mean, there's 271 pages of figures I could go through to see how this antibody works. So I would then go systematically clone by clone through the three, four available clones that I know are out there and go through this process for each one until I figure out based on the information available to me, which one looks like the best clone. And that brings us to the end of our antibody adventure. Thanks for joining us today and make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any future episodes. And with that, We'll see you in the next one.